neural networks work extremely well. By taking the same underlying idea and applying it to different kinds of training data, we can have a deep neural network do things as varied as playing the game of Go, recognizing cancer, translate languages, and even drive a car. It seems like there is something special about the core principles of neural nets that makes them uniquely suitable to being applied in a wide range of potential tasks. And some people might argue that this hints at the very early ideas of building truly general artificial systems. Now, despite the unreasonable effectiveness of these neural nets, we've seen a long academical journey to try and understand why these networks are as effective as they are. And so in this video, I want to dive into all the academical research that tries to look at what we already understand about the learning dynamics of deep neural nets. So specifically, we'll take a look at the remarkable ability of neural nets to memorize huge amounts of training data, even if there is no specific pattern present there. We'll then take a look at how the surprising result changes our views on the learning dynamics of these networks. And finally, I'll introduce a very interesting theory that tries to explain this surprising result from the viewpoint of information theory. If you want to learn more about the learning dynamics of deep neural networks, then I hope you're ready to dive in deep. My name is Xander, and welcome back to Archive Insights. <laughs> deep neural networks often have far more trainable parameters than the number of training examples that they're trained on. And for some unknown reason, they seem to generalize very well despite violating the conventional rules of statistical learning. Now, to understand why this might be the case, we'll start with a very interesting line of research from 2017, where a team of researchers did a series of experiments to investigate how good neural nets are at simply memorizing their training data. So in the first experiment, they trained a deep conf net on CIFAR-10, which is a data set of 60,000 32 by 32 images divided into 10 classes. But next to the normal training regime we're all used to, they did a whole series of interesting experiments that hint at some very, very interesting characteristics about these deep models. So in one of their experiments, they replaced the target labels, so the output classes of those images, with completely random labels. So in this case, there is no clear relationship between the input images and the target labels that the classifier needs to learn to predict. And nonetheless, they showed that when you take a simple two-layer neural network and you train it for long enough, it actually manages to memorize the output labels, which are completely random, of all 60,000 images in the training data, achieving a training accuracy of 100%. And sure, I mean, we all know that neural nets can overfit, but that's pretty impressive, right? And they also executed variations of this experiment where the labels are kept unchanged, but the images themselves are replaced with totally random pixels. And sure enough, the network again manages to memorize the entire training data set. Next, they interpolated between 100% random labels and the actual labels. And then they compared how much time different network architectures needed to overfit on the data as well as how that affects their generalization error on the true test set in the data. And in the graph here, you can see that for some mysterious reason, uh, a newer architecture like Inception, for example, which has a lot more parameters than say AlexNet or a normal Perceptron, somehow manages to get a much better test accuracy on the true test set when trained on partially corrupted labels. And that's kind of interesting. And then finally, the researchers investigated how far they could push this memorization experiment. So what they did is they took the ImageNet dataset consisting of 1,280,000 images, replaced all their labels with random ones, and sure enough, after training for long enough, a large model, Inception V3, was actually able to achieve a training accuracy of over 95% on completely random labels. And now obviously these networks that were fitting random input-output relationships, well, they also got random performance on the test set, which is to be expected because they didn't learn anything. The main point though, was to show that these networks are very, very capable at simply memorizing input-output relationships, even if there is no explicit structure in that data set. 
And so all these experiments, they basically beg the question, well, if these neural nets are so good at just memorizing the training data, well, why do they generalize at all? Why are we able to train a network on a training data set and then it actually manages to do something useful on an unseen test set? Because if the network were only doing memorization, then that wouldn't be possible. And now, of course, many people will say, sure, but when we're training a network, we actually apply explicit regularization. We use things like dropout, L2 norm, to basically penalize memorizing the data set. And that's the reason that these networks generalize. But in fact, we know that even without those explicit regularization techniques, the usual neural nets still do pretty well on unseen test sets. So regularization alone doesn't explain why these modern architectures generalize as well as they do. So then what is going on? Well, to dive deeper into this intriguing story, let's take a look at a line of research that was actually an answer from Joshua Bengio's group on this initial line of work. So their assumption was that, yes, of course, these networks can learn to memorize the training data eventually, but in fact, these networks will tend to exploit actual patterns in the data and only later employ memorization to completely overfit on the training data. And so to test this, their main idea was that if the network is learning simple patterns first, well then we should be able to find some examples in the training data that fit these simple patterns better than others. Or in other words, you know, some images in the training data should be easier to classify than others when we're early on in the training process of our network. However, when we're training the same network on random noise or random labels, then this difference between easy and hard examples should be much less clear because everything is random anyway. And this is exactly what they found. So when they tested this on CIFAR-10, they saw a large variety in the output probability of the correct class label, proving that some real images really are easier to classify than others. When training on random labels, however, there was no such easily exploitable pattern, you know, forcing the network to rely entirely on memorization instead. Additionally, they also showed that for real data, you can actually get quite good performance with a very small network because those simple patterns are kind of easy to learn. But if you want to memorize random data, then you actually need a much bigger network to do that. And finally, the paper contains a lot of interesting experiments of how different types of regularization actually affect the fitting or convergence time of a network when you train it on real versus noisy data. So it's actually really interesting to take a look at that paper. The link is in the description. So in summary, the work by Bengio's group basically showed that the learning process of neural nets is content aware in the sense that the network will try to exploit the easily accessible patterns in the data first and only then start going to memorization in order to completely minimize its loss function. All right, so the picture we have so far is that these deep neural nets seem to be very capable at memorizing large amounts of training data, but when we train them on actual real data, they have a tendency to first exploit actual patterns and only then start overfitting by memorizing the remaining noise in the data. And now to get an even better understanding of this entire story, I want to dive into a related line of work that emerged during roughly the same time period by Naftali Tishbi and Henrik Schwartz from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So their main idea was to look at this entire learning process through the lens of information theory. And specifically, their entire analysis builds upon the idea of mutual information. So I want to spend just one minute to really clarify this concept before we move on. So mutual information is a statistical quantity that measures how much one random variable tells us about another. It is generally expressed in number of bits, and you can think of it as the reduction in uncertainty about one variable when we have knowledge of another. So high mutual information indicates a large reduction in uncertainty, whereas low mutual information indicates a small reduction. And zero mutual information between two variables simply means that the variables are independent of each other. And that's really all we need to know for now. So in the case of neural nets, the random variables that we're gonna look at are the hidden activations inside the layers of our deep neural net. More specifically, we're gonna look at the mutual information that each layer's activations 
contain about the input image X and the target label Y. So when training a deep neural net, each layer is basically getting information from the layer below it and transforming that information into a new space by using a matrix multiply and a nonlinear activation function. And so in this sense, a deep neural net is just a large Markov chain of these nonlinear transformations that progressively transforms the data space into the label space. And the chain is Markov because the computation is blocking, or in other words, each representation can only be calculated once the previous layer has finished its computation. All right, so with those ideas in mind, let's dive into Tishby's work. And trust me, it's some pretty beautiful stuff. Now, the first thing that we can notice about these mutual informations is that they form a chain of inequalities that are called the information pass. And this basically tells us how much information is there in the activations of layer one about the input and how much is there in layer two about the input and so on. And because the network forms a Markov chain of these transformations, the mutual information about the input can only decrease as we follow the flow of data through the network. And in fact, the same inequality also holds for the true desired output labels Y, since every layer transformation must always lose some amount of information and nowhere can there be more information about the output class than in the image itself. All right, so now let's dive into one of the most beautiful visualizations of deep learning that I've ever seen. And I'll let Tishby himself explain what the setup looks like. So these two coordinates, the information about the input versus the information about the output or the desired output, are going to tell us a very interesting story. So in order to see this, I, I, I'm going to use uh, this movie that some of you may have seen, but it's always very important to see it again. So what you see here are these two axes. The, the x-axis is the information that each of the layer has about the input. The y-axis is the information that this layer has about the output, and the colors represent layers of a specific neural network which I trained 100 times with different random initial conditions and different training data. And so what we're currently looking at is the initial condition of the network where you can see that the first hidden layer in blue contains quite a lot of information about the input X and the target label Y. And this kind of makes sense because most of the information in the image is still present in that first hidden layer, even though it passed through a single random you know, computation. On the other hand, the output layer of the network, which is in orange, has very low information about both X and Y, which also makes sense since most of that information gets destroyed by all the random layer transformations in the network. Remember, this is a picture of the network before training, so all the weights are still random. And now let's take a look at what happens to this picture if we start training the network on the MNIST dataset. So the very first thing that happens is that all the layers rapidly move upwards, which kind of makes sense because this means that they are learning to extract information about the target labeled Y. However, at the same time, the layer activations also move to the right, meaning that they learn to retain more information about the inputs X or in other words, they are memorizing the input data to some extent. And Tishby calls this the fitting phase of the network. And then after this first phase of fast fitting, <laughs> first phase of fast fitting, yeah, the network dynamics transition to a second, much slower learning phase where the layer activations actually continue going up, but now they move to the left in the information thing. Or in other words, they're actually starting to discard some information about those input images. And the general theory here is that it's actually in this second phase that the network learns to forget or to ignore the irrelevant parts of the input pattern. So these are basically the things that are not labeled in the images, like the background or different lighting or brightness conditions, you know, noise in the images, all of those things. And Tishby calls this the forgetting phase of the network. And if you look at the number of epochs, we can see that the first phase happens relatively fast, after about 300 epochs of doing stochastic gradient descent. But the second phase happens much, much slower, converging only after about 10,000 epochs. And now you might wonder what happens to this story if we start training our network on subsets of the training data. Well, it turns out that our story holds as long as the training data set is sufficiently large. 
In this case, we quickly converge to the green line, after which the very slow forgetting phase starts, which makes the network robust to the irrelevant parts of the input. But on the other hand, if we train with only 5% of the data, then we can see that if we keep training beyond the initial fitting phase, the layers actually start moving back down in the information plane. So in other words, they are losing information about the output labels of the test set. And so this is what traditionally has been called overfitting, but Tishby himself prefers the term overcompression, since what's basically happening is that we're compressing the representation of the data to a point beyond what we're allowed to do in order to generalize to the test set. And this entire story of what is happening during training in the information plane is actually beautifully backed up if we look at the gradient signal that is flowing through the network. So this beautiful graph right here shows the average mean and standard deviation of the gradients for each layer during training of the network. So in the fitting phase, the mean is quite high and there is very little noise, or in other words, there is a very stable learning signal for the optimizer. But then in the forgetting phase, the mean of the gradient drops significantly while the noise actually picks up. Or in other words, the signal to noise ratio of our learning signal actually drops significantly. And this perfectly explains why this second forgetting phase is so much slower than in comparison with the initial fitting phase. And finally, I think it's also very interesting to look at what happens to this entire story if we start playing with the depth of our neural network. So what you see here is the same training process on exactly the same training data, but now visualized for different depths of the neural network. And you can immediately see that the shallow network containing only one hidden layer, in fact, follows the exact same dynamics as we've seen, but the compression or the forgetting phase just takes a very long time to converge. In fact, even after training for 10,000 epochs, the network still hasn't converged. So while a shallow network can, in theory, learn to represent any function, in practice, it's actually very hard to learn that function in a reasonable amount of time. And in contrast, adding more depth to the network seems to dramatically speed up the convergence time. Now, obviously, I don't have enough time in a 20-minute video to dive into all the beautiful details, but if you want to build up some intuition on why adding depth to the network actually you know, makes this training convergence faster, I would really recommend to check out the entire talk by Tishby himself. I will link to it in the description. It's beautiful. So this turns out to be quite interesting because this gives us a completely new understanding of why the layers help you. And I'm going to finish with this. So to wrap up here, if we go back to the essence of the problem, it really comes down to this surprising result that neural nets that often have millions of parameters, I mean much more than there are training examples, somehow manage to converge to local optima that seem to generalize very, very well to unseen test data. And so in other words, to explain the successful generalization of neural nets, there must be some kind of magical force that actually regularizes the network during training. And now, as it turns out, many recent academical research actually points to the inherent noisiness of the stochastic gradient descent process as one of the core components of this generalization success. And so this issues a lot of very interesting research questions. Like Tishby himself says, maybe we should be using more random noise to make better compression algorithms. Okay, so we know I mean, what, what, what is it in, in, in this stochastic dynamics that actually put you to optimal compression? This is not something we used to have in information theory. I mean, nobody, as far as I know, is comp well, of course, there are many random codes all over the place, but nobody is using noise. I mean, random walks, I mean, diffusion processes in order to compress. Maybe you should. And so, as always, everything that I've just said is the current view of what we know about deep learning. But obviously, there are many people with different ideas, and there's a lot of things that we simply don't know yet. So what I want to end with is a couple of very interesting directions of problems that we simply have no answer for just yet. So we know that stochastic gradient descent relies on randomly sampling mini-batches in order to inject noise, therefore converging to flat local minima, and then also generalizing to the test set. But the question then is, how does that relate to the learning in biological systems where the input data is simply a continuous stream 
of highly correlated inputs. I mean, these two paradigms seem to be completely opposed to one another. Secondly, it's often quoted that the simplest program that can explain your data is the best one and will generalize optimally. One fact, it's actually a fact, it's a mathematical theorem that you can prove, is that if you could find the shortest program that does very well on your data, then you will achieve the best generalization possible. With a little bit of modification, you can turn it into a precise theorem. And on a very intuitive level, it's easy to see why it should be the case. If you have some data, and you're able to find the shorter program which generates this data, then you've essentially extracted all, the, all conceivable regularity from this data into your program. And then you can use this object to make the best predictions possible. Like if, if you have data which is so complex that there is no way to express it as a shorter program, then it means that your data is totally random. There is no way to extract any regularity from it whatsoever. But then how does that relate to this ongoing trend in deep learning where the number of trainable parameters in these models is simply growing exponentially while also getting better on the same tasks along the way? I mean, those two things seem to be opposed as well. And then finally, what is the link of this entire story when we look at unsupervised representation learning where we don't actually have any labels at all? So currently, a lot of people are investigating what the optimal loss function in that case should be. For example, right now, most people are using things like reconstruction losses as a training signal, but it's quite clear that that is really not the optimal thing we should be doing. So the real question is, when we as humans grow up and we learn to understand the world without any supervision, what is our brain really doing? All right, so as you can see, many interesting open problems remain, but at least we're gaining some insight into the internal learning dynamics of these wonderful deep neural nets. Thanks for watching. Maybe think about liking or sharing this video, and I'd love to see you again in the next episode of Archive Insights. I think we're done.